Absolutely. I mean, we, we talk all the time about Texas A&M's 12th man, but if you look around at this environment, they've got Vuvuzelas, they've got all kinds of sound makers, they're going to be waving some flags. It's going to be an electric atmosphere. And Mike, really one thing to note, what's different about this stadium, the fans are so close to you, so it really makes it feel like the noise is right on top of you. Here come the Aggies onto the field. Thunder sticks and brand new flags that they just unveiled all created as fan designs turned into reality. And here in Fayetteville, the Razorbacks have been almost unbeatable now for half a decade. AM gets the first touch and we're underway. This is the SEC on ESPN and on a Thursday night, it's one of the great rivalries in the conference, AM and Arkansas. And AM into possession through Mia Pante. Ahead from Sample. Recovered by Taylor Pounds. Twisting free Carroll. And left back by Becerra. Launched up for Hayes. Miley Hayes pushing wide, seeking Beckman. Good leave. Franklin on the run. Trying to unleash Potagill. Kenneth Caldwell's been there, done that against Arkansas. Knows when to leave the line. Jill was in an offside position. When you think about Texas A&M, Marion, how do they come in here and get a win? Give me a couple Crowder keys. The first and foremost, and the one that everything falls under, is the decision-making under pressure. When you look at the roster of Texas A&M, they have the playmakers. They have the ability to really deal with Arkansas's pressure and really come out of this with possession when they swing it around the back and when they try to break the lines. And then once you do that, the second key is going to be quality of the final ball. So once you actually do the buildup successfully against this Arkansas pressure, can you then have the concentration and the focus to make sure the timing of the ball, the execution of the ball, the texture of the pass, it's all there. Because it really, Mike, when you look at the performance, performances that Texas A&M has put on. They have some of the most creative buildups in this conference. And I think that what has been missing for them when you look at the goals column is the quality of that final ball. There's no doubt they're going to have chances, but it's so much easier when we say the quality of the final ball. Think, is it easier to finish a ball that's bouncing in the box near you? Or is it, is it, is it easier to finish a ball that's really low, driven on the ground? Those kinds of things. That's going to be important tonight. Yeah, G. Guerreri says send service at knee height and he'll end up in the parking lot. Beckman. Full stat back, Pante. Overlap from deep from Matula. G. Guerreri is the one and only for Texas A&M. 30th year at the helm, closing in on 500 victories, both as a D1 head coach and in his time at AM. And, you know, the last couple of years have been a challenge. And he'll be the first to say, look, there have been injuries. And certainly their forward lineup last year was oh, yeah. seven down at some points. But they've had a little bit of luck go another way. Yep. They feel like they can put this together here, even three games into the conference season, still have a successful campaign. Get back to the postseason. And I think that they're in a really frustrating position because like we've already said so many times in the early part of this game, just look at the roster talent that is available to him. I mean, Mia Pante is one of the elite midfielders in this conference. You look across the back line, there is Katie Smith, there's Karina Sample. And then you look up top at Lainey Carroll. You look at what Mally Hayes and what a, co a couple of the subs are going to be doing tonight. And 
the technical skill is there, the soccer IQ is most definitely there. So the frustrating part of that is, why is it all not coming together? And that's what they're trying to figure out here tonight. And a big, a big key tonight for them that we didn't talk about is really going to be that confidence piece. Beckman swinging forward, Carroll and Barbara scoops it up. So if confidence is one of the key things for AM for Arkansas, how do they end up continuing this good run of form within the within the league? I think for Arkansas, you kind of have to do what you've been doing, your bread and butter, which is to win the 18s. And really against this Texas A&M side, the most important piece to that is winning the set pieces. Texas A&M is a team that gets fouled a lot, and Arkansas just naturally with the way they play, they concede a lot of fouls. So you're going to have to go up strong. You're going to have to make some big plays in the air from a set piece perspective. And then keeping it one-sided. And by this, I truly mean the pressure part of the game. Texas A&M is going to be able to swing it around the back. They're going to be able to break down pressure more easily than other teams in this conference. So if Arkansas can do a much better job at keeping Texas A&M locked to one side, they're going to have way more success in their press. Well, it's one of the series of call it 15 second restarts that G. Guerrero describes that you have to win against Arkansas, throws and set pieces of all varieties. Driven away by Caldwell. Ushered up to Carroll. Good run coming out of midfield. And Beckman got picked off. surreptitiously forward for Potagil, taken over by Franklin. Franklin can really marshal that midfield. I think B. Franklin does her job unnoticed. You know, she, she's a player that, I mean, she's tough, she's gritty, but hardly ever gets called for bad fouls. She's a very, very smart player. And really, she never holds on to it too long. She's always a player that's going to go up, collect it, spray it out wide, spray it out to the next person. So she is the glue that holds this Arkansas midfield together. But but really, if you didn't call her name or weren't aware of who she was, we probably would never be aware of her in the game. But Sarah trying to work off Hayes. Potagil, track star racing through, and Smith up to the task. Sliding in Carlina Sample, the former Defensive Player of the Year in the conference. And offside stymies the Arkansas wave of attack. Arkansas, under the tutelage of Colby Hale, pulls out that notebook early. There was Arkansas before Colby Hale, in which they didn't really win anything. And now you've got the Arkansas of today. Six straight conference finals and three consecutive SEC regular season titles his 11th season at the helm. It was interesting hearing the juxtaposition between the early Arkansas days playing A&M. A&M arrived from the Big 12, Big Bad Wolf. They felt like flip throws and gimmicky plays and can we come up with a set piece goal? Right now they feel it's a little more two evenly matched strong programs getting after it in different ways. As Potagil plays this wide. Return to Potagil. Trying to spin Smith and send it wide of Tankersley. You know, I, I remember thinking that Arkansas always had something up their sleeve. You know, even, even when I was playing and they were kind of in this transition from being that, that Arkansas that we know now, you always would prep for them kind of in a what do they have up their sleeve manner. So you're always kind of working on some different set piece situations. You're always working on different pressure situations. And now they have truly come into their own. They are their own brand of soccer. They have their own team identity. And I thought it was really interesting what Colby Hale said. You know, he felt like the first few games for this team, they didn't have an identity and they were just mooching off the identity created by the classes before them. And he asked them, literally said, do you want to be the forgettable class? All ahead, got by Pente and Carroll as well. Grabbed there by Grace Barbara. I mean, to your point, the idea of the forgotten class, a lot of this has been, it's a reputation earned by previous years. 
also described as like a track race, and there's a good number of track runners on this team who would get it. If you're doing the 4 by 400 and you're handed the baton for the last last race, last leg of that race, it doesn't really matter how big a lead you have. You still have to finish. Absolutely. Throw in from Reamson. And I think that becomes even more important now that we look really across the landscape of the SEC. The teams that were at the bottom, the teams that have struggled, they are rising slowly. The, the bottom has been brought up to meet the top. I mean, we saw those standings, just how kind of crazy that was when you look at the historical standings of this time. You know, normally it's the Tennessees, it's the South Carolinas, it's the A&Ms that are at the top. And now we're seeing that success come from any program, really, at this point in the season. So. To your point, I just think that finishing, really really making your mark on this program is going to be even more important for Arkansas. Well, interestingly, the Razorbacks get into their bench 10 minutes into the game. Reagan Swindle comes on and replaces Reamson. And to be fair, Swindle's played a good number of minutes, nine starts, 10 appearances. It's not a surprise to see her in the game, but Clearly making an adjustment in the early going. Yep, we've shifted to a 3-4-3, three, a three, three, that traditional 3-4-3 three, three that Colby Hale likes to play. So started this game in a four-back, which, you know, you and I were talking was a, a little bit off-brand for what he likes to do. Typically no changes, but they have seen something where they feel confident to go back to that three-back, four in the midfield, three up top. Well, without Carolyn Calzada, AM had to make a few changes themselves. They went from a traditional three back to a four back. You see those two separate looks over the course of a year, certainly, but preparing for it all week with the pressure that Arkansas brings, yeah. surely AM had to be a little surprised. Absolutely, but you also had to know I mean, let's be real, G has been around the block for a while. You know, he has been in this league. I, I would be surprised to think that. He didn't think that maybe there was going to be a shift at some point and that they prepared for both. And, you know, he, he told us that you always prepare for a plan B, sometimes even a plan C if you're playing a team like Arkansas. But I think the biggest note of all the roster changes, of all the starting lineups in this game is the fact that Quinn Cornog is starting at center back for Texas A&M. <laughs> we haven't had to say Quinn's name all that much, which is a good start for any center back. skips out and Matula runs over to scoop this up. I mean, all of a sudden these become two of the more tenured coaches in the league. You look at G. Guerreri, 30th season at the helm, but Colby Hale is eclipsed a decade now as well. Ricochets out towards Swindle. Franklin. There to backstop, Shayna Flynn. Held up by Malum. Shayna Flynn has impressed both of us, huh? Oh, yeah. But look, you, you leave UCLA, they're doing fine without her, <laughs> but it's, it's quite the fine to pick up a player who didn't really play a lot at UCLA, and we've we've been pretty mystified by how well she's fit this system. It baffles me, honestly, a, a player with her versatility, her physicality, her technical skill on the ball, her, her understanding of space. Like, right now, you know, she's probably a true outside back. At the next level, she's probably a true outside back, but right now we're seeing her play kind of in that, that outer part, that wing spot of the diamond in this 3-4-3. Three, and a player that can kind of just shift and move with the formations just shows how intelligent she is as a soccer player. Barbara sends this flying forward, seeking Potagil. Head her toward Filippo, And head-to-head -head contact, they're going to stop play. two Aggies colliding.
And you gotta love the the dedication. Obviously, not the result of anything that you wanted to happen, but the dedication of those Aggie defenders committed to not letting the ball drop, not letting those bouncing balls in behind them for kind of that chaotic inside the 18-yard box style that Arkansas likes to play. Quinn Cornog is the player down. Just not really a position that A&M has a lot of depth in right now either which is part of the reason why Cornog was there in the first place. A midfielder who transferred in from Vanderbilt over the offseason. 19 appearances for the Commodores and was all freshmen in the conference last year. She is really such a talented player, and when it's specific to this game, I do think it's an interesting move to, to put her back there, maybe out of necessity, but I do also think that there is a matchup there. She is not going to be a center back if she comes back into this game. She is not going to be the player that needs to go up and battle with the target forwards of Arkansas all that much. She's going to have to just innately in that position, but really her purpose back there needs to be as a passing center back. She's going to be that decision maker for them, a player that's very comfortable under pressure and can move the ball up the thirds and really command that buildup for Texas A&M. Well, going to get a, a seat on the bench here for the time being. And Sawyer Dumond has come on. Just 90 minutes played this year. Back freshman year, it was sort of, we, we have too many center backs, and Dumond was part of that conversation, but behind two of the best in the conference, didn't really get a lot of minutes. And this year, Calzada has jumped in and impressed so much, but nursing an injury, being held out of this game. Skipped up a little bit on uh, Malum. Well, for the moment, it appears A&M is holding their own in this game. I agree. I think one thing that they're doing a good job of is the front, the front runners for Texas A&M are doing a really good job of staying high on the three back. It's not allowing for Arkansas to really push up all that much. They're having to really be aware of that ball in behind. Smith was trailed by Tankersley. Foul from Arkansas, and there wasn't a lot in that from Swindle. And see, Mike, this is that moment that I, I would like to see Kenna Caldwell just play it short. AM, be confident in your buildup. A little bit of danger scooped up there by Barbara. Hey, here's our Saturday night football game presented by Capital One, top 10 ACC matchup in Death Valley. Number five, Clemson coming off a thrilling double overtime win against top 25, Wake Forest. And quarterback Devin Leary and number 10, NC State are 4-0. Chris Fowler, Kirk Herbstreet have the call 7.30 on ABC and the ESPN app while the colorful Pat McAfee does it for the brand hosts the ESPN2 telecast. Are you a fan of Manning cast, McAfee cast? I love the Manning cast, honestly. I'd love to do Crowder cast at some point. You've seen my reaction. Like, <laughs> you are, you have the privilege, I'm going to say, to see my reaction to some of this. <laughs> I don't know if that would be a good thing or bad thing to have my face on camera at all times during a game. It's a risk that I think yeah. is worth taking. <laughs> Cornog's return, by the way, which is good news after that head-to-head -head contact about five minutes ago. Returns right to that center back position. Mike Watts, Marion Crowder from Fayetteville. A&M's lost their last four to Arkansas. They've started conference play 0-3. The Razorbacks, as good as any team in America on their home ground. Ball scooped ahead, Potagill, heavy touch off the right foot, trying to lead that forward. And it's engulfed by Caldwell. Yeah, Caldwell making the decision early, no hesitation to come out, is able to pick up 
Anna Potagil is bad first touch, and I would say bad, but really it was more just a heavy touch. I think the idea was there. She wanted to split that defender, have another shot on goal. Well, those are the little decisions from Smith. Sometimes better to put it out for a throw exactly. than to put it back into the middle of the field. So often, Arkansas is trying to do this throw in five seconds or less. In this instance, they ignore the old Phoenix Sun offense and throws it in a little more length. Malum somehow maintains, lofts all the way through to the back post, and Caldwell got a piece. Bangs off of Cornog and out to the far touchline. My, oh my, Kenneth Caldwell. And this will skip away from Miley Hayes. Take a look back at Caldwell's big moment. So this all starts from just bouncing balls that A&M isn't able to get any touches on. And it's the flick on to the back post. Jesse Filippo just really outworks Karina Sample. And then Quinn Cornog with the misclear. Kenna Caldwell, though, reads it all the way. Look, we've seen her have some big time saves. I, I think back really to their performance at Clemson when she was the lone player in my mind that kept them in that game, allowed them to have that 0-0 draw. So we know she's a goalkeeper that can keep them in it and she's gonna have to keep making some big saves because as we've already seen, Arkansas's ability to win balls aerially in the 18 yard box is, is truly unmatched. I think Cornog, you say missed clearance. If she gets nothing on that, Potagil's tapping that in. Easily. Filippo got it wide. Malum up for Potagil. Header down, Filippo on the first time. Cornog and with the deflection spins away and out. On a night where they've got smoke and fireworks for goals, AM right now putting the kibosh on all of it. Yeah, and Arkansas is really doing a good job to attack centrally and then spring it out wide with no pressure on the ball from Texas A&M. And look, that is one of the reasons that they transition into this four-back is because they felt like they could get more pressure on the ball. They could have more of the ball with the four-back. So if you're going to go that way, your outside backs have to step to that. You cannot allow Arkansas just to have an unmarked clearance. Beautiful service, Caldwell. Amidst a forest full of trees, as far as Malum. Skipped it off of Becerra. And this is as a team where Arkansas really likes to thrive. So Texas A&M is gonna start to feel more and more of the pressure as Arkansas tries to keep them pinned into their defensive half. Header, spear, goalward corralled by Caldwell. And that's the thing about Arkansas. It, at times in a game, it can feel a little bit choppy, but when they really get in a flow, oh yeah, it's, it is a beautiful sight to see. And here they go again. A&M couldn't even get that across the halfway line, although the deflection sees it to Becerra. And that's a nice pocket pass to open things up a little bit. Pante. Hayes, seven goals a year ago, two so far this season, nearing the midway point of the campaign. Pante, curled toward the penalty spot by Hayes. Dug out by Ellie Potagil. Potagil running onto this extraordinarily talented player, but in a much different way than her goal scoring sister. Was a sorely missed player last year in midfield. Arkansas into the penalty area. Cornock trying to get a piece, turning, and away by Sample. That was Malum all the way up there. Ooh, okay. Becerra. <laughs> I see you, Sydney. For a freshman. 
Look, you hear Kenna Caldwell back there screaming, get it out, get it out, get it up the field. And you're right, so much of this, and this is why to me this game is a little bit up in the air. Because look, Texas A&M does have young players. And <laughs> you cannot replicate how Arkansas plays. As much as you want to try in training, you just can't do it, especially on their home turf. So I think it's so up in the air because it truly depends on the decision-making level of some of these young players. We just saw Sidney Becerra with the technical skill to break that pressure. Oh, Potagil in behind. Plenty of contact, referee has a long look. That's a goal kick. Nothing doing for Arkansas, and Tankersley is unhappy about it. So it's Ellie Potagil who is so good in the service delivery into the 18-yard box. And I think that's the right call. Quinn Cornong barely gets a little toe tap into Tankersley's thigh, it seems. Here's a better look at it. Potagil, the good service. Tankersley has been on the end of it more often than she has it. Reigning SEC Offensive Player of the Week. Cornog, the header, steered away. And Riley put under pressure. And Ella Riley puts a, a halt to those proceedings. Going to go into the book. And that's just a great individual effort by Molly Hayes. She is a workhorse for this Texas A&M attack. Really does the dirty work, a, a blue collar type of player. And makes a lot happen on her own. But here is where Texas A&M could really be dangerous. They are great in the air. They are strong on set piece delivery. Macy Matula, a wave at that. Barbara's got it now. I think you pull that service back literally three inches. That's a goal. Great first look, though, and that's what we talked about. Set pieces today are going to be really important because Texas A&M is one of the best in the conference at it. They always have been. And with the way that Arkansas plays, they just concede a heavy amount of fouls. Potagil bangs that off Matula. Arkansas has been the beneficiary of 10 resets to this point. It's 19 for AM. So they've created a fair number of those opportunities, be it throws or free kicks, corners. Try and change the dynamic a little bit. Those are momentum plays. And I think people who don't have a history playing in this game may not understand the value of it quite as much. It's going to get out again. The momentum of the restart, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Especially when you're looking at playing a team like Texas A&M, who, look, they want to have the ball. They want to play. They want to possess. They want to swing it around. They want the game to move and ebb and flow. And it's really hard to do that when there are consistent restarts. Donald and Smith entered here. Potagil saw that taken away by Cornog. Cornog, part of last year's Vandy team that, I mean, really genuinely exciting young crop of talent. Darren Ambrose is put together up there, and they've retained most of it, to be fair. That's a goal kick here for AM. Let's take a look at our featured ESPN Plus college football games for Saturday. Quarterback Donovan Smith leads the Red Raiders into Manhattan to take on Deuce Vaughn. And number 25, K-State, noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. And 4-0, Syracuse squares off against Wagner, 5 Eastern, 2 Pacific. Get ESPN Plus. Go to ESPNPlus.com or download the ESPN app. Congratulations to all our broadcast friends from dare I call it upstate New York, <laughs> enjoying Syracuse off to a 4-0 start. Dare I call it.
I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest they're going to make it 5-0. and oh, But, <laughs> oh, you're talking about the upstate Yeah, part. that was the limb. <laughs> From South Canada. Syracuse has been a cardiologist's worst nightmare to this point. <laughs> I like that. You're really funny today. Yeah, yeah, I, brought I just a lot wanted of heat. to tell you that. I brought a lot of heat yeah. today, Mary. I wish that we could have been recording you for the, the pre-show. Sure. We could have made a whole stand-up act about you. Well, we, we had Big Red in the booth, which always brings a smile to our face, the venerable Razorback mascot. It's all good, good times here in Fayetteville. Absolutely. Lots of love from the mascots. True enough. He's going to swing over Potagill. It feels like Smith has been Potagill's shadow throughout this game. Likely by design. Ellie Potagill, Tankersley. Felt the contact to Cornog, sent it across, sample sweeps it away. I mean, Arkansas is just so good at creating kind of that half chance, not even to look on goal. It's a half chance to get to the byline and then actually get a quality service across the face of goal. We've seen that numerous times already in this first half. But one thing to note that I don't think we touched on is, is the subs that came in up front for Texas A&M. So number 25, Jai Smith, number five, McDonald. I think those are players that can really challenge the Arkansas back line with their speed, their athleticism, their combination play. But it's just a matter of relieving that initial pressure. A&M digging just a little bit deeper in their bench now. The Sarah comes off. Georgia Lab comes on. Ball whipped across. Hatter lifted over the bar. Carlina Sample was in the area to defend. And Potagil came sprinting downhill for it. And here we see again another half chance. Let me just see what I can do to get to the byline. Beautiful service, but it's the run. That looping run from Anna Potagil that opens her up and allows her that direct line to come in for a powerful header. And she is not the biggest player on the field. There's no question about that. But she has a knack for goal. She has a way to get some body part on it somehow or another to get in the back of the net. A true nose for goal forward. Well, the numbers certainly bear out for Anna Potagil. Four goals this year, but 41 in totality. Jill and Parker Goins, such a dynamic tandem over the last couple of years. Goins, one of the three Razorbacks that are playing up in Louisville for their NWSL franchise, racing Louisville. Actually, the Aggies list of active NWSL players shortened by one midseason because they brought Alyssa Motts back to coach in College Station again. And what a dream for a player. You know, we, we talked to G, and he said there's no doubt that we have several players that want to play at the next level. And I remember when I was going through that and just wishing that I had someone that had been there to talk me through some of the things that you just can't know unless you're at that level. So what a dream for some of these players that want to continue on playing to have Alyssa Motts, the pride of the NWSL, come back and, and be an available coach to them. The crowd was roaring because B. Franklin showed off a little technical flair. Fans here in Fayetteville show up in droves. Down goes Franklin, throw for AM. The locals love that. <laughs> Contact from Riley. Riley bursting through again. 
Flick forward by Pounds. McDonald shoved off. Belongs to Arkansas. And that was a really good idea from Taylor Pounds. I think the problem right now is, and I can speak to this, because as a forward, you know that they're especially a fast forward. There are some games you know I just have to be willing to run. And this is one of those games. It needs to be always within reaching distance of the Arkansas center backs. And so I think a little bit that we're not seeing right now is that willingness of the A&M front runners to just run, make that slashing run in behind, really, really stretch them. But the space is there in behind. See that big upcoming matchup. I'm not sure everyone really understood how big that matchup was going to be when the schedule came out. Kentucky LSU on Sunday over on the SEC Network. This is our Thursday night primetime game. Typically, you'll see us on SEC Network on Thursday nights all regular season long. Well, today, coming to you on ESPNU is the Razorbacks and the Aggies. Relive this rivalry once more. Potagil playing at Central. Take a look at that score line. Number five, Alabama. That game was supposed to be played tomorrow. And due to all the weather issues, got moved up to tonight. Alabama two, Georgia nothing in the second half. We're going to be talking about West Hart's program, Alabama is every bit the monster that, that they appear with that national ranking next to their name. But also Ole Miss and Mississippi State in the year that those programs have had. All nationally ranked and all maybe having a program defining year and a power shifting year in the SEC's Western Division. Ball thrust away. South Carolina is trying to overcome their one and two start as well. They're scoreless with Sam Bohan's Florida Gators. That's in the first half. I think Sam Bohan has a, a very bright future at Florida. Mm -hmm. And and I hate that I hate that South Carolina is struggling because kind of like Texas A and M, the pieces are there. I think though even more so for Texas A and M, the the full picture is there. For South Carolina, the story is just the ability to score, to, to produce goals right now is just not happening for them. A&M, to me, is the team that I can't really figure out. I think that they just need a turning point. A and dare I say that today could be it. You produce a quality performance. You get the result this time, perhaps, on the road. And is this a, a game that turns around your season? You look back and say that was the moment that it all clicked. You Maybe. had no comment on Georgia, but here you are standing I, up for Florida. Aren't I supposed to be unbiased? Yeah, well, you are. I'm trying to no, be. you're doing a great <laughs> job of it. I never thought I'd see the day. <laughs> You've taught but, me well. I've grown up, okay? <laughs> Matula puts it to the top of the 18. Zoe Shepard came on a moment ago. A ball sent all the way in to Barbara. So Shepard coming off the bench moves Malum to the opposite side and Shayna Flynn. Grab a seat here for Arkansas in the final 10 minutes of the opening half. Covered here by Taylor Berman. Racing down the line, Malum. Well, the numbers could have been good there instead. Scoop back up by Arkansas. Got it around Sample and right to Caldwell. Keep that. Instead, floated long. Caldwell again. 
How does Arkansas spark this attack a little more? Because it felt maybe 15 minutes ago they sort of pinned AM back a little bit. Is this a territorial game at the moment? A little bit. I, I think when Arkansas has gotten to the byline, they are creating a lot of trouble. But I think that AM truly is doing a great job right now of not panicking. What Arkansas likes to do when they high press is put teams in panic mode, make them play a style of soccer that they don't like to play, that's not their team identity. And AM is putting up a good front at the moment. Now, granted, we have seen the Arkansas press flow, and when you said, like, when it starts to flow, it is hard to beat. But for the moment, AM is doing a really good job of stepping in front, not allowing that press to be set. What I think they can do a better job of is really swinging it around fully, finding the oppos opposite winger, because there is space there. There's space on the width. There's space in behind. Ainsley Erzin comes in, not on a soccer scholarship. This is from the track team with love, Erzin. 11th appearance, couple of goals. Turns out really good at both sports. The ball flicked away by Smith. Sent through. Smith after it. I've always wondered what that felt like to be like that good in two sports. Weren't you a power forward center? <laughs> I can't say that when people can't see me. Yeah, and the box enough. that I have to stand on <laughs> <laughs> open. <laughs> Collision there. Spinning around Taylor Berman. Oh, good and, ball. Yeah, leading Shepard. Look, you made reference to it with this Arkansas team. They can make things chaotic and feel out of sorts as Saul comes on for Shepard. That's a short-lived intrusion onto the field for Shepard. But there's days where it works, and there's yeah. days when it doesn't. Also, some of that you'd have to think is just how composed a team like A&M can be in that moment. You know, take a look at Arkansas in wins and losses going back to 2018. I know this sounds obvious. You give up more goals when you lose. But when you look at the staggering number of goals they've given up one to the other, Colby Hale talked to us about it and said, look, when we lose, it's epic. And the reason why is teams that can actually play through this pressure, few and far between. When they press together as a unit really well, almost impossible. So you think those losses, sure, you're usually playing a better team, but it's a team like A&M that can be composed. So then it comes down to, are you pressing well together as a unit, and can A&M adequately put passes together to get past that press? Yeah, and to me, that's why one of the keys for Arkansas tonight specifically is to keep them to one side, because A&M is a team with individual players that can relieve pressure. For A&M, it's coming down to, are you going to make the decision to not panic and not play in the way that they want you to play? And are you going to keep your style, even though you're you're a bit uncomfortable with them playing at the speed and the tempo that they do? But, you know, I, I always think it's interesting. When we talk to coaches around the league, a lot of the, the sentiment is, you know, Arkansas just makes you play such a different style. And it's Arkansas as a team, to me, they're not chaotic. I think they're actually a very organized, like what you're saying, they're a very organized team in the press. And because of that, when it's working, it makes the game chaotic because the opposition cannot ever relieve the line. And so it just feels like it's this constant back and forth and back and forth. But sometimes I think Arkansas gets a bad rep, really in just the way that they press other teams into playing. And look, the, the other team that immediately comes to mind in the college game that presses to the extent that Arkansas does, although Arkansas does it a little differently. So a and gets this forward, kept away from Smith, sits up kindly and with a deflection will bounce back to Barbara. 
would be Anson Dorrance's North Carolina. Yeah. Mixed with a little bit of Matias Almeida's San Jose Earthquakes with that man marking <laughs> system. I love that. Back Good in the player day. call, man. But, but also, I, I think sometimes people are like, it's only Arkansas, it's only Arkansas. Look at how Mississippi State has won some games. True enough. This is a really good run forward for A&M. It's kept away from Jai Smith and cleared by Potagil. Scooped back up by Sample. Kate Colvin in the wide area. I mean, A&M last year, they called it the air, uh, or rather Ole Miss, they called it the air raid the number of goals they scored on long set pieces, long balls forward. They made your life miserable. Yeah. It, look, it's not like other teams are. And Matt Mott is very frank about that. You know, we play for throw-ins and set pieces and corner kicks. So it's not some big secret that this works. I, I think what makes it so evident when Arkansas plays is truly the organization that comes with their press. All sent forward, askew. A&M didn't have a shot between the third minute and the 42nd minute. They've only been held to under four shots in the first half twice all season. And that would be the case right now with under two minutes to play in the opening half. One thing A&M's gonna have to really look at in the second half, when they swing it, the space is there. They swing it through again. This is Arkansas this time around. Trying to spin into the wide area, Erzin, and Sample bombs it forward. So look, this is a great look. Look at all this space. But as Arkansas retreats, they're gonna bring numbers back centrally. And so when you get this. McDonald, McDonald! Off the outside of the net. Well, McDonald sort of pumped the brakes, lulled maybe someone into a false sense of security, and then slammed the accelerator. You know, my point there, to be honest, was going to be you're going to have to do a little bit more creative job at uh, bringing Arkansas out of the central part of the field, or like you, <laughs> could, you could just do that. You just run past them. I mean, th that works too. Described as a human lightning bolt by G. Guerreri, Micaiah McDonald. Final minute of the first 45. You're going to want to stick around for halftime. Some of the regulars in the SEC floundering at the outset. SEC games tonight and Friday. We'll show you the full slate. Ball in front, asking questions. Finally, Arkansas. Final seconds of the first half breakthrough. Potagill. And it's the restart, the long throw from Tankersley. And it's a flick and another flick. Can we create more bounces in the box? And we talked about her nose for goal, her ability to read the situations, understand where the open space is and where the ball is going next. Anna Potagil just sneaks that one past Kenna Caldwell. And you have to think, the Texas A&M, after the half they've had, where they have gone stride for stride with this Arkansas team. They've broken the press several times. They've had great opportunities several times to give up a goal this late in the half. Disheartening for this A&M side. 18 seconds shy of the buzzer. And Arkansas takes a 1-0 lead going into halftime. They're calling the pigs here. As the Razorbacks grab the advantage, they are 7-0-1 this year when they score first. And a perfect five wins from five games in which they led at the half. And the celebration among these fans culminates in fireworks for the first time all season. 
well as the pillars of smoke that they've acquired behind the goal. And the Razorbacks are off and running, trying to make it five wins in a row against Texas A&M. Who better to deliver for this home crowd? Coach, what's the takeaway from that first half other than 18 more seconds? Yeah, well, I, I thought that we started off great. Um, you know, real real dominant at the beginning. Our, our last pass, which we, we talked about, you and I talked about earlier in the week, it's that last pass that we, we need to be able to put someone in on goal. Um, but I was really pleased with the way we, we were able to break the pressure. I was pleased with the way that we were able to move the ball. Um, towards the, the end when we were making subs, we tended to come in with amnesia and, for, and forget about those things. We'll have our starters back in, and uh, I'm pretty confident about how we can get back out and uh, get control of the game again. Gee, I thought that your young players, you and I talked about the decision-making, how important that's going to be in this game. I thought the decision-making to relieve pressure has been excellent so far in the first 45. Gave up that late goal in, in the first half, so I'm just curious as to what the message was for you in the locker room. Well, that we can do it. Can, can you beat these guys? Yeah, we can beat these guys. So, but you've got to, it has to be a flawless half. You can't have a, a little brain fart at the end and leave someone like Potagel open seven yards from your, from the goal line. And, and again, we've got to, we've got to score. We've got to find a way to score. So we're going to get set pieces because they're going to foul us. And we have to be able to take advantage of those. We've got to be able to take advantage of any half chance we get so we can get ourselves back in. Thank you, G. Appreciate G. Guerreri is always spending a little time with us. Legendary coach and still very much involved in how to take this college game to the next level. That's something we'll talk about in weeks to come, hopefully. But his uh, goal is to modernize the, the college soccer schedule and what he's done with this program over 30 years is awe-inspiring for sure. This will run all the way out to the end line. So we heard from both coaches, yep. Marion, at halftime. Let, let's hear from you on this. <laughs> Arkansas says you'll see a totally different Razorback team. A&M went into the locker room going, sure, we're down one nothing, but we feel like we proved to ourselves that we can win this game. What's your takeaway from that first half? I think for Arkansas, you kind of have to realize that they are always going to be their own worst critic. There's always going to be good performances, but there's always going to be room for improvement. And to be quite honest, I, I thought the final ball wasn't as bad maybe as Coach Colby Hale thought it was. I mean, it did lead to a goal. It led to a lot of chaos, a lot of bouncing balls that we saw Texas A&M tough to defend. So I think the more they get to that end line, the more they create those services in front of goal, the more dangerous they are as a team. And then for, for a and I, I totally agree with the approach to the halftime. It's not necessarily that they need to make any structural changes. The game plan they had was working until the subs came in, right? That's kind of what you have to worry about is does the level drop off when I make substitutions? But now that you've got the starters back in, there's nothing that needs to change. It's just got to be that mentality switch. Can you beat them? Yes, you can. Now the question is, do you believe that you can beat them? That's for Texas A&M to decide, I think, in the second 45. You know, this 0-3 start, we asked about the morale within the team at training this past week, and G. Guerreri sort of intimated there are teams that draw a line in the sand and say, we will not accept this. And there are the teams that maybe start to buy into the idea, hey, maybe we're not that good. They had a, a yeah. very strong non-conference season, as they usually do. Well, there's the whistle. It's late arriving. It's against Carlina Sample, who's dealt with some injuries over the years. It was the 2020 SEC Co-Defensive Player of the Year. Of course, the problem with AM saying we're bringing on our best 11 that we have available at the moment, so is Arkansas. <laughs> I was literally thinking that in my head. I was like, I hope this is where he's going with this, because that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Flynn is back. And uh, waiting to take this set piece. Tankersley is there as well. Flynn drives it across. Header goes up, second header away. This is gonna fall, Hauser. And that's an inconvenient bounce off of Carroll. Arkansas trying to uh, get this forward as quick as they can. Maybe they can beat the smokestacks that they've lined up behind the goal. They have to switch sides at halftime. Actually, 
had them in the wrong goal going into the game and had to move them all the way around pregame too. Maybe that is the uh, the motivation that Colby Hill gives the, the team at halftime. I want you to score faster than they can bring the cannons over to the right half. <laughs> You know, they did a survey here, and there are some folks that don't really care for the smoke cannons. What? Count me as any way we can sort of add to the the vibrance of the college game I'm here Absolutely. for. Absolutely. They're in position now. And so, too, is Hauser and the Razorback attack. Caldwell tried to get a touch to that, and it's rolled out to the halfway line, and Erzen. If they win, there's a, about a minute and a half long fireworks show that's going to surely interrupt our post-game coverage. It's going to shoot out from the stadium next door. Nice leave off for Hayes. And recovered by Riley. Ahead from Tankersley. Into the width and Erzen. Foul conceded by Hauser. It is amazing how many white shirts congregate down in that corner when it's a deep throw for a and Which, to be fair, is better than the striped or hoops kit. Not your favorite, eh? No, these are half hoops <laughs> for Texas A&M. But the numbers are unobscured. There's a lot of jerseys I describe as would love to buy one wouldn't love to commentate on them. <laughs> Sample got undercut. And that was sort of an awkward attempt to get up off the ground as well. Yeah, that's Ainsley Erzin that made the tackle. Seems to be doing okay. going to bounce away on Laney Carroll's effort. We were scoreless until 18 seconds remaining in the first half. Arkansas threw Anna Potagil, her fifth of the year, put the Razorbacks ahead, ranked 12th in the country. They've been in the top 10 already this year, but a win against AM would be their fifth win of the season in five tries at home. 16 straight home wins going back to last year. A&M trying to avoid their first SEC four-game losing streak in their decade-plus tenure in the conference. They've only had three three-game losing skids since they got here. And what's tough for G. Guerreri is he goes, take a look at the stats, watch the games. Georgia, Mississippi State, they outshot the two teams 33-16, especially Georgia, and yet they walk away with a loss. I mean, from an alumni perspective, I can't even lie, seeing that 3-2 win, you know, that, that was electric because when you think about as the player that played in that kit to go and get that win at Texas A&M, that is an indescribable feat, but to your point, it was three goals on three shots from Georgia. Yeah. And then for Mississippi State, it was, I don't even know if it was a one-shot game. It was an own goal. Oh, wow, yeah. Corner here for the Razorbacks. Header in front, bounces down again. Flag has gone up on the far side. Caldwell was able to leap out on that before it pierced the net. And here's the look. A&M does not play with post players. So when this ball is just kind of juggling in the air, right, so when you have post players on the corner, your cue is up, up, up. That's going to be a handball. That is an inconvenient truth for Tankersley. 
So when you have the post players on the corner kick, right, you have one near post, one back post, and they are basically the safeguards for when your your goalkeeper goes out and tries to make that, that parry save. They're the ones that are back there saying, hey, if you don't get this, anything we're going to try and get. A&M doesn't play with those post players. So it is even more dangerous when Kenneth Caldwell comes out and doesn't collect something for those bouncing balls in the air because there's no one back behind her to have that goal line safe. Well, and the other side of it is Tankersley, I believe it was, that got hit in front of yes. goal. Would have been on, on side. On sides, 100%. Yes, absolutely. So there's sort of that give you have and to take. Hope. Yeah, no post player. At least there's the, the potential if you step your line up. I'm putting you on the spot. What would you play with? Zonal marking yeah. or post players yeah. or? Or just would you choose to have post players or no? Hard, right? Yeah, it's hard decision. no, it is. The thing is, I like the idea of zonal marking. I almost okay. never care for the execution. So if you're going with man, <laughs> That's fair. If, you're, if you're going with man marking on corner kicks, then I'm not sure I'm willing to give up two players to go guard 100% the Hundred percent agree. Hundred percent agree. Especially with an Arkansas team where they have so many set piece threats. Mm -hmm. You throw two players in the same zone, you're getting someone unmarked. Ball forward is going to run all the way to Barbara. Just had a quiet evening. And to that point, you know, maybe you trust a goalkeeper like Kenna Caldwell enough that sure. if she's going to come out, she is going to make that save. We don't need the players in behind her. I'm going to quiz Jill Lloyd and our resident goalkeeper on this next Can we week. just say, phone a friend? Yeah. <laughs> Have her live on air. L live from home. <laughs> live from home. Jill, what's your Here, opinion? Here's Jill. <laughs> <laughs> I've long been a proponent of that. It's just Jill's too good an analyst to be used as solely the goalkeeping oh, expert. Oh, absolutely. But uh, count me in on that. Flynn comes on for Swindle. Razorback still. Banging away in front of goal, seeking a second. That's going to bounce up to Caldwell with Di Filippo on the doorstep that time. Where were you positioned on defensive set pieces? The halfway line. Hon honestly, you're not even going to believe this. Like, I don't even want to tell you. Do you want to know? No, come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, near post. The goal with near Mary post. shoot over her. <laughs> Just bend it right, right into the near post. Love it. Nothing she can do. She's the giver of Olympicos. <laughs> that gets sent into the bench. That is always a rowdy Razorback bench contingent. Bounce down, effort to keep it. That's a foul. And that may have caused some real damage. Smith is in some, some real pain here. Leg sort of went through, and yeah, you can see Smith is in some, some real pain. There's an empathy for the player, of course, but as far as A&M is concerned, I'm not sure there's any player you can less afford to lose. G. Guerreri must feel like the most snake-bitten coach in the SEC. Katie Smith out of that same TSC hurricane program that produced about half of the Arkansas core that went to final after final. And Smith, the leading minute getter on this team, this would be a third consecutive year, leads the group right now, practically never comes off the field. And G. Guerreri is walking out toward Katie Smith, who's captaining the team this year. This is nightmarish for Texas A&M. I think the look on his face says it all. Yeah. The coach, you know that 
told us in our coaches call, I think he had dubbed his team Masters of the Woodwork. So you, you know that he felt kind of ha that he had that unlucky card for this season. This certainly doesn't help. Oh, man. You know, I think of G. Guerrero and I think about him in, in a role of servant leadership. Oh, yeah. And he's the one, along with the athletic training staff, who've been far too busy for Texas A&M helping Katie Smith off the field after an apparent right leg injury in a tackle at the top of the 18 a moment ago. Sawyer Dumond is coming back into the game, had to replace Quinn Cornog after a potential head injury in the first half. Now has to replace the other center back, Katie Smith. The Arkansas athletic trainer asking if there's anything she can do to assist. And for Smith, you can't help but have a, a little bit of a broken heart in this moment. What a tremendous player she is. And something you, you truly, there, there are no wor words other than you hate to see a situation like this. Being helped behind the, the bench dugout here. Play will continue. Dumont comes on for the injured Katie Smith. As unfortunate as that was, you've now got to have the next man up mentality. There is still a game to be played. And I would argue there's even more on the line. You see one of your own go down like that. A player that has for so long carried this program has been a, a heart of this program. All driven ahead, soars, cleared. Franklin puts it down, Tankersley. And if you're Dumond, you are walking into a shark tank. Yeah. Here in Fayetteville, that is a extraordinarily difficult role to fill. But you've got the players around you. And Dumont has experience. I, I, I think the, the talent level is there. Now you've got to rely on your other players to pick you up, help fill the pieces. And it's truly got to be the, the next man up mentality. If, if it's going to be something you say to your players, and G has told us he, he says this, it's now got to be put in action when the situation arises. But you've got to think that. That ball forward just beyond Tankersley, grabbed by Caldwell. I think Texas A&M has two choices here. I think one choice is to, as you look at the ball over the top, look, this is so good from Arkansas. Textured pass, best as ever from Malum. Just a little too much on it. But back to Texas A&M and, and really the options you have here, and I don't mean options from any kind of tactical standpoint. I'm talking about the yeah. approach to the game. You can either choose to let this be kind of that, oh, we hit the post. Oh, we didn't allow a lot of shots. We outperformed a team, but they're better, right? You can allow that mentality to come to you, or you can choose to say, we have a player that went down and we want to play for her and we have even more of an edge to us right now to make this win mean something even more. Well, A&M only had three shots tied for their lowest in the first half all season. They're going to have to find a way to spark that offense, but right now they're back on their heels. Ball forward from Flynn and the header finds Caldwell. Well, it's a dangerous set piece pumped forward here. Seeking Tankersley, rolled back by Dumond. It 
was something I had noticed, but it never really connected the dots. But our producer, Todd Coolis, mentioned it and elicited a really interesting response from Colby Hale. You see the tempo of the throws increasing from Arkansas. They'll have games during practice. The ball goes out of bounds. First player to pick it up, it's their ball now. They train how quickly they can move the tempo of the game. Which is something to, to be said for that. I think a lot of people train situations, right? Like if you get a red card and you go down a man, or if you're up one kneel with 10 minutes to go, how do you handle the situation? But truly, a lot of people don't teach style of play other than the mainstream play faster, one or two touch. That, that's how the, the typical coaching style is. But to have something that's active and is really training the habits of these players to play faster, that's very, very unique to what Colby Hill does at Arkansas. It's one of many unique things he's done to turn this program from a bottom dweller into among the most terrifying to play against in the country. The numbers don't lie. At home, almost unbeatable. De Filippo, Caldwell. The idea was beautiful there from De Filippo. I love that little outrun that Ava Tankersley had to separate herself from the dropping defenders allow DiFilippo to have a choice. Do you want to play it in the gap? Do you want to play it wide to my feet? I'm giving you that option. A very similar run like what we just saw her make in that moment. The quality of the final ball wasn't quite there, but the idea was, was spot on. Now that's overcooked from Pounds. Let's tell you about our Saturday night football game presented by Capital One. Top 10 ACC matchup in Death Valley. It's number five, Clemson taking on number 10, NC State, who are 4-0. Chris Fowler, Kirk Herbstreet have the call. 7.30 on ABC and the ESPN app. And Pat McAfee is hosting the telecast over on ESPN2. I just hope it emanates from the Thunderdome. Time will tell. Ball swing out here. Backman. Well, can a and find an answer? Becerra. Carried forward by Matula. Well done. Advantage played. Matula's got ideas. Out to DiFilippo. Potagil. Dumond the tackle. Need to see a little bit more from the AM front runners. I think the midfield is doing an excellent job to, to try and keep possession, but they're having to play two, three, four touches right now in the midfield because the runs just aren't there from the AM front runners. You saw G. Guerreri there. No Calzada. Now Smith injured. Last year, it was seven forwards at one point that were out. Oliveri was expected to be the star of this team. That flies forward. Signed in the Mexican first division over the offseason. Ball laid back. A ton of contact. Referee allows play to continue. Circling out Flynn. Flynn delivers. Caught by Caldwell. Four white shirts in her vicinity. Despite the, the scoreline right now, Kenna Caldwell is playing excellent. She's had several big saves and maybe not highlight saves like we typically think of, you know, the outstretched diving far to her left, far to her right, but saves that have been in a lot of traffic. They've been through a lot of players. It's been very impressive. She has to command the game now with these players oh, out, yeah. right? So not only do you have Calzada not available, we just saw Smith go down with an injury. You've got Quinn Cornock, who is a great player, but doesn't typically play the center back position. So there's still a learning curve there as well. Sussy just came out and Shepard returned. 
Well, typically, this is a three back that AM plays. They switched to a four because they didn't feel that they had three center backs that fit the system and would be put in the right position as young players in some cases to make decisions on their own. And the further we get into this game, with Arkansas leading, a and may also have to contemplate going back to that three back, and now they don't have Smith to lead it. I agree. And I think one of the other things they thought the, the four back was going to give him was the ability to, to really swing it around the back easier and mm -hmm. give more options to build out of that pressure. But as you said, the deeper this game goes, the more desperate a and becomes for a result, the more likely we're going to have to see some of that go away and honestly, put some of your athletic players into 1v1 situations. I think you put a McDonald, a Smith, a Hayes in a foot race, they could beat any of the defenders on Arkansas's back line. But can they get in position to exactly. do it? Exactly. This will be a, a goal kick. I had one pro coach described by another coach as he'll press you while you're going to the bathroom. That's the level that you're yeah. at. That's about right. Filippo is back <laughs> up after a little bit of a knock there. You know, last week we had Filippo on post game, and it was yes. just good to hear her talk about finding her confidence again, playing effectively within this group and about the expectations that these Razorbacks have for themselves right now because the way this game is going, the way the last three have gone, does feel like they're very much within reach of all their goals. And we, we talked about that a little bit with Colby Hale, maybe in a, in a different manner. I felt like the game last week was them kind of getting back on the right track. Ball whipped across. He's going to ask a couple of questions and get out. But then I felt like the game at South Carolina was kind of their their staple. And it was what Colby Hale called a culture win. Are you willing? Will you do the things necessary? And that just proves right there. We just saw Jess Filippo really try to do a half turn, have a half shot on goal. Well, and not only is Filippo playing really well, but Filippo is also the team DJ. That's a whole different role that is oft under discussed. And here's a series of songs that are currently on the playlist in the locker room. I mean, first one, first one is none of which money. I know. What? I know none of these people and none of these songs. Okay, so we need to have an educational. I mean, session. I know who Drake With me, is. Me, you, and Je well, thank God. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I know Meek. Do you Future. live under a rock? <laughs> You're well, telling me you don't know Dreams and Nightmares by Meek Mill. Like, like uh, of any of any of them. I'll uh, give you the rest of them. If I heard it, maybe. You don't know Knife Talk? No. Oh so that's what the team's listening to. It's funny because the reason it came up this week was Colby Hale comes on to his, his Zoom call with the, with the production team in the lead up to this game. And he's got, like, this Great background. awesome background yeah. of Great background. literal records. He goes, here's the record player, and over there is a guitar, and he's, he's talking about ACDC and Eric Clapton and the Beatles and his – his enjoyment of acoustic music, which you thought was a bold-faced lie. I, I still do. <laughs> I'm gonna make. I'm gonna go down to the field after this game is over. Make him look me in the eye and tell me that he <laughs> listens to acoustic music. There's no way. There's no way. He he seemed pretty confident if he said, "Look, if if we win X game, I you know you get to pick the music for the rest <laughs> of the year. If if not, I get to pick the music. He thinks that'd be the best effort the Razorbacks ever gave him. I honestly agree because if you look at the difference of the records that he had on his back wall Which compared to all better than the top five songs I, that were listed. I, I look, I agree to you from a music personal music taste. I totally agree with the records that were on Colby's wall. But I'm just telling you, from the five that were listed as like our, our top, you know, warm up songs, our top locker room songs. I guarantee you that is all the motivation that this team needs. Like, do you really think that they want to be listening to Eric Clapton First before off, a game? Whoa there. Like, I'm not I'm not no. personally mad at it. Though. Well, and Fleetwood Mac and, and Led Zeppelin, I mean, okay, you but can I, find some good pump-up music there. I, I was mad he didn't know who credit him. Fleetwood was, though. I have to, That's I have true. To say. 
Steve Filippo's come off, and they'll have a little bit of time to contemplate the song if they win in the locker room. We'll have to check back in at Orange Beach and see if the Pensacola. If the yeah, yes, Pensacola. See, even me, it's an ingrained habit. By the way, speaking of Pensacola, to everybody in, in Southwest Florida, it looks like Pensacola has largely avoided anything but but some rain from Hurricane Ian. Thoughts with everybody down there. Absolutely. As this collision from Shepard and Dumond leads to a free kick for AM. it forward with a header bouncing around on the run Pante swivels around Malum the second time up to the task McKinsey Malum I think has had a really great game today on both sides of the ball and then a player that I don't think we've seen enough of has been Mia Pante for Texas A&M she is one of the most elite midfielders in this conference, and we just really haven't been able to see a lot of her skill on display tonight. And I think that goes back to the fact that Texas A&M is really struggling to switch the point of attack in a consistent manner. Big collision on the sideline. Referee's gonna brandish a yellow instantly. Potagil chopped down, and Dumond is very much putting her imprint on this game. A definite yellow card, no question about that, but I, you have to say props to Dumond, who is coming in unafraid of what she has just walked into, which is potentially one of the most intimidating environments in SEC soccer. She says, I'm here to play. I know what's at stake. But goes down, takes a knee just there. And a trainer's going to come on. So Dumond is down on one knee. And if the trainer does have to come out, the athletic trainer is going to come in here for Dumond. There appears to be a laceration to the head here. Take a look. Oh, my. On the left temple on the edge of the... edge of her eye there I I'm not sure G Guerrero knows who the next center back down is I think maybe this is the the opportunity that's throwing you though into into a three back it, you can figure out if you want to play a four back for the rest of the season you can figure that out later but I do think maybe this is an opportunity for you to move to that three back see if you can get another goal you're down to 18 minutes left in the half you need a result tonight well, there's an interesting move. Anderson Williams is going to come on, the redshirt freshman from Calgary, a forward by trade. And if that's true to form, we'll see Williams slot in high up the field, and they might go to that aforementioned three back. And believe it or not, it might be Quinn Cornog who has to run it. So Dumond is going to be attended to. Service forward, that got cleared. Throw for Arkansas. A stoppage here. The official has stopped the clock as well. So the game clock just got changed to 1754. Throw in, header, Malum can't turn on it. Attempting to slide through Jai Smith. 
Becerra leading Pante. Held up by Smith at the halfway line. Seeking support, wins a throw. Foul from Jai Smith. Our Sunday matchup has a lot of intrigue to it. Looks like Kentucky has turned a bit of a corner this year. They take on LSU and Sean Hudson's well-versed side Sunday to Eastern on the SEC network. Those two teams are near the top of the standings. Arkansas could pick up a third win in three tries to pull up on nine points in league play. A&M is on the verge of starting 0-4. Touched over by Potagil, that gets away. AM just trying to get a hold of the ball here. AM could move to 500 after an excellent start in non-conference play. These two sides were co-champions in 2020 in the SEC, and it has been a very diverse path between the two since. Ball forward here for the Razorbacks, and coming out Caldwell with authority. And right now, what we're not seeing enough of, you mentioned that AM really just trying, trying to gain possession, trying to gain some control of this game. And that clearance falls tankersly. That's why that clearance left a bit to be desired. And Tankersley was all too happy to have a go at it. And in the sequences that led up to this, it's the fact that Texas A&M is not winning the second ball. They're challenging for the first, but no one is anticipating where that second ball is going except the Arkansas players. They're the ones pouncing, creating chances, getting goal uh, corner kick opportunities. Quarter hour to go. This venue starts to shake on these moments. Ball across. Header could open the door again. Sample covers a lot of ground. Well, Sample has had to play a huge role today and has. Oh, she's been busy. Beckman for Becerra. Filippo returns. Berman checks out. And you know, we didn't, we were seeing if, if Anderson was gonna be that that player to make them go into, A&M go into a three back. They are still in a four back. She's technically playing as a holding mid right now. Got by Filippo. May get a second crack at it. Launches this ahead. Pursuit of Potagil. Racing for the end line. Well, it's another great crowd here. And if the numbers hold at Georgia and South Carolina, their averages for the year, tonight here will mark 100,000 plus through turnstiles at SEC games this year. Arkansas in the top 10 in the country and the SEC was just over, uh, just under 4,000 away from that six figure mark and they should pass it here tonight. That's incredible. It has been a banner year. South Carolina, A&M, Arkansas, Georgia, all four figure attendance averages 
come to the SEC, you will be seen. Had a bouncing corralled here by Williams, taken back. Filippo with the help of Franklin. Filippo trots in. Oh, Filippo swings a shot in, tried to put pounds in a blender. The fancy footwork from the attacking midfielder, a true forward, but uh, honestly, I've enjoyed watching her. So for the past two games now, we've seen her at that attacking midfield role. We talked to her about that in the interview last week. And look, at the next level, she's a true target forward. But right now in the college game, I think that she presents an interesting player for the middle of the park because how how valuable is it to have a midfielder, one with the vision that she has, two with the, the ability to strike from distance, check, check. But really what I like about her in that 10 role is the understanding of the runs in front of her from a timing perspective, from an idea perspective. It allows for so much creativity when she has played in that target forward role, when she's played in the wide role. I think that's what's really bringing the Arkansas attack to life as of late. I thought it was the music. No. No. It, it's, it's not me, nope. it's, it's No. Free <laughs> Meek. <laughs> this will get out over the near touchline. <laughs> you, you, you and I are going to have some conversations after this. Change coming here, and we can tell you that Saturday's Week 5 SEC Network College football lineup looks like this, number 17. Texas A&M takes on Mississippi State at 4. At 7.30, number one Georgia in Columbia squaring off with Mizzou and Como. It's our SEC Saturday night matchup. Both games are also available on the ESPN app. Squared wide, served for Potagil, punched away by Caldwell, trying to get back into goal and was tested to the post. Oh, that was a long way back, and Shayna Flynn asking some genuine questions. They've been asked from every angle on Kenna Caldwell tonight. She has been absolutely tremendous despite the scoreline. Comes out big, makes this initial punch out save, and then has to do a lot of quick footwork to get back to that near post and punch it out for a corner kick. But the work does not stop here. Arkansas is so good from this situation. Fifth corner today for Arkansas. Header squared. That's a goal kick. Caldwell, little bit of a TikTok celebrity. And has just made dramatic improvements over the offseason, according to G. Guerreri. In terms of taking the athletic traits to the next level, along with good footwork that she's always possessed. It's gonna go sprinting by McDonald. And this one of three games occurring in the SEC tonight. Alabama knocks off Georgia. They led 2-0 and they get it over the finish line. Two goals to one. And South Carolina trying to bounce back from their loss to Arkansas. Number 22 team in the country by a slim margin defeat Florida back in the win column. Back to 500 in the SEC. We'll touch central. Rolled out. Well, that means Alabama is just continuing to roll forward toward what could be the the decider in yeah. the West and in the conference, perhaps. They uh, host Arkansas on October 16th. That's a, uh, it's a Sunday game on SEC Network. What a game that will be. I think what I'm most curious to, to note from a – Alabama perspective look they have been scoring goals nonstop, but innately and very naturally in every single season there is probably going to be a time when the goal scoring slows down a bit so I'm interested in Alabama you know do you have the anchor of the back line to really hold down the fort when maybe the scoring isn't as prevalent as it is now 
And I think that's a game that we, we really see what Alabama looks like as a full picture team because Arkansas is going to test them like no team has yet. Cornog. That's wayward through midfield. DiFilippo. DiFilippo has a go. And Caldwell looked like she had that under control and it squirts out of her arms and out over the line. That almost got thrown into her own net. And have a look here. It's DiFilippo again from distance. Oh. And that could have easily uh, an inch left, in the, and that's a goal. But instead, it's another corner kick opportunity for Arkansas. And look how many players they have starting so far back in the half space. It's going to be delayed runs, unmarked runs into the box. Sixth corner bounced off of Williams. Clearance and another try. Sent up the hill. Arkansas's vice grip is tightening. About six minutes to play. Slid to the top of the 18. That's rifled toward goal. Away from Beckman trying to get a hold of it. Ushered through Potagill. Dances. Leans back Franklin. All the way through, and across, and out. Right now, you're just seeing the commitment from this Arkansas Razorback side to go up, win balls, win the 50-50s, not allow it to get out of the Texas A&M defensive third. And I think the difference that we saw in the first half that we're not seeing so far in the second is that the Texas A&M players were really committed to getting stuck into tackles. We're seeing a bit of lazy defending from the A&M Aggies right now that's allowing Jesse Filippo and players like her, B. Franklin and Apodigil, to have way too much time, way too much space on the ball. And what was difficult for Arkansas in the first half now seems a little bit easier. Roll back, here comes the pressure from the Aggies. Barbara got it away. You saw that schedule, two ranked teams, but in some ways kind of a misleading task ahead of them. Yep. You'd have to say against Florida, they'd be an honest favorite. The Vandy's always a tough team to face, and in some ways the perfect elixir for what Arkansas brings to the table. And Alabama, and then a week later they get that matchup with Ole Miss. I mean, it's not an easy road ahead. No. Filippo. the Aggies, they get Rice over the weekend, and if they don't come away with a win here, that's the kind of game that'll drastically alter perceptions. You need to get a result there all of a sudden. Because then you get LSU in College Station next week on our Thursday night primetime game. Then they go to Ole Miss on ESPNU. Flynn. Hanagil sprinting for the ball. There is nobody up there. And Hauser clears this away. It was left in the open from Riley. And the whistle goes against the Aggies here. It's Jai Smith. G. Guerreri, it's going to be difficult. Get home for that LSU and Auburn game, but you got two top 25 road games staring you in the face. That LSU and Ole Miss game, you'll see both on national television. Throw here, A&M. Three minutes to go. Aggies have been shut out in back-to-back -back games since September of last year. That was at Auburn and at home against Arkansas. Potagel scored the winner in that game as well. 
That one took overtime. This one just in time before the halftime whistle. More precious time leaks away. Good chance Anna Potagil is the player you'll hear from post game if her goal stands as the winner. If you're A&M right now, there is no one up against your back line. All right, there's Anna Potagil that's in the vicinity, but you've got four backs back there, and, and you're down a goal. You'd have to think that Carlina Sample, some of the, the wing backs would start to push forward a little more, really make this into a 3-4-3 a three, three maybe situation, push Lainey Carroll higher up the field. She's kind of on an island over here on the right wing. We haven't called her name very much. Haven't called Pante's name very much. A lot of that's because they're, they're really not getting the second ball. They're not winning that, but there's also just not the numbers there. Closing in on the final minute. A fruitless offensive performance tonight for AM. Can they make something now? Ball drops back. Hayes trying to lead McDonald. The uh, home numbers are staggering. For the first time in that incredible span, the 53rd win will come with fireworks over the stadium as well. If they could just see it out another 30 seconds. It's with 18 seconds remaining in the first half. Watch out, long way away. If anything, you've dumped it all the way down and another five seconds dissipate from Filippo. There's the 18 second mark in the first half that Arkansas pulled ahead. And it doesn't look like AM has any buzzer beating magic in them today. Five straight wins against Texas AM. And Arkansas picks up a 1 0 win on the back of Anna Potagil's late first half goal. And the Arkansas offense that usually provides the fireworks will give way to fireworks overhead here in Fayetteville. Hey, sometimes it's nice not to have to do all the work yourself, right? <laughs>